We've got an interesting story. You're going to be really encouraged and blessed by tonight's meeting. But uh, we've been doing these now for almost a year since lockdown started last year. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people have watched these programs. And thousands of people have clicked on the salvation link at the end of the meeting. And maybe you are looking for change in your life. Maybe you are looking for the meaning in life. Well, if you are, you can also click on that salvation link at the end of this meeting. This meeting is going out on Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube. But don't just watch it yourself and enjoy it. Please pass on the information to your friends, to your neighbors, to your work colleagues. Tell, it, tell them about this wonderful meeting that's on tonight. Encourage them to, to log on and watch this meeting. And if you have any needs tonight, any prayer requests, then you can contact us on the Live Stories uh, number that we can see on there, our dedicated hotline, 07943-550-287. You can contact us on there, and someone will get back to you either immediately or very soon afterwards. You can phone, you can text, or you can WhatsApp, and someone will be in touch with you very shortly afterwards if you have any needs you want to share. And tonight, if you uh, have been blessed by this meeting, you can contact us and let us know what has happened through this meeting tonight. Just to let you know that next week, our speaker is going to be a man called Daniel Dugmore. He's traveled the world as an extreme sports enthusiast before his life crashed after getting hooked on Class A drugs. In his radical salvation, God showed Daniel he knew his past, present, and future. And he became addicted to encountering God in prayer. And God has continued to lead Daniel and his family to live an extreme life of faith, serving and seeing God's miracles among those most in need in some of the poorest nations in Africa, working with youth with a mission. He has an exciting story that he's going to be sharing with you next Monday. But tonight, our guest is JJB, Jamie Jones Buchanan. Jamie comes from Leeds. He, um, just a little bit about him, he's an ex-professional rugby player. He played for Le Leeds Rhino, but he started playing rugby when he was nine years old with a club called Stanley. He signed for Leeds Rhinos when he was 15 years old. And he got his debut in 1999. He's played over 423 professional games. And he'll tell you probably more about that. And he will tell you, too, how his life was changed as it was during the time he was playing rugby. But now he is a coach, which is his, uh, his lifelong dream was to be a coach for Leeds Rhino. And he's got his dream. He is now a coach for Leeds Rhinos. And so some of you, especially the ones watching in America, I know some of you are a bit puzzled by this game of rugby. But you need to watch it because it's something like your American football, but no protection, as you'll hear. Anyway, it's great to have Jamie with us tonight. and Great to have you all while you watching. And I hand over now to Jamie. Jamie, I give it to you to come and share your story with us. Thanks, Jamie. Good evening. Thank you very much, Alan. I don't know if you've got a bit of an American accent during that introduction there, mate, but it's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Um, it was my dream, actually, to become a professional rugby league player. And more importantly than that, represent... My hometown club of Leeds, I've grown up, I was born and bred in uh, West Leeds in Bramley. Um, but before then, just like to say thank you for the invitation. It's always wonderful to share uh, my faith in Christ and uh, my journey walk with God. Um, I, I much prefer to be around people. You know, it's, it tells us early on in the Bible that it's not good for man to be alone. Though we've all come accustomed to virtual meetings and, and Zoom as such, I do much prefer to be around and have that intimate out um, in two theatre plays. I, I did a little bit of acting a couple of years ago. Um, as far as I understand, you know, the only the only creatures, the only um, the only creatures God created that tell stories are human beings and life's a narrative. Human beings are only animals on planet that tell each other stories in life, entertain, educate and inspire us. And I thought to myself, um, I, I, I quite like the theatre and I became um, a board member of the local theatre company and ended up in two theatre plays. One was called Playing the Joker, which was about the late great Eddie Waring, who was a BBC commentator. And the other one was called Leeds Lads, which was about the Battle of the Somme. And one of them was um, on the theatre. So he was on stage and it was a very stereotypical method in which to perform. But the other one, the uh, Playing the Joker, was in the round. 
So when he was acting, he was surrounded by the audience. He was in a, he was in a community club. He could have been in somebody's front room, any venue that was large enough uh, to, to accommodate. And it become really clear then that the best part about communication is the actual intimacy about, about re being around people. That being said, we have got the advantage of being able to speak to those on the other side of the world. So it's a pleasure to be able to tell my story to you as well. And I am a rugby league player. And if unless you're from the north of England, you might not know what rugby league is all about. You know, the, uh, the vast majority of rugby players would probably be rugby union players, which was the, uh, the original game. Uh, rugby League was born out of Rugby Union in 1895 out of the North, out of um, poverty and rebellion, essentially. I won't go into that. That's uh, time for another day. But as Alan said, I'm an ex-professional Rugby League player. I live my boyhood dream. I represented my club for over 22 years. I signed for Leeds as a 15-year-old fanboy way back in 1997. Uh, and 22 years later, 421 games, three Challenge Cup finals, eight grand finals, three league leaders, uh, 144 different players. Later, I retired in September 2019 and went on to continue that journey, representing my club as an assistant coach. Now, I'd love to log on next week and listen to the, the sportsman who's going to give his testimony. And it's interesting listening to uh, people talking about drug addiction. I, I want to throw something a little bit different to you. Uh, today, um, you know, drug addiction being one of those things that we um, obviously don't want to be in. And a lot of the stories that you hear when people give the testimonies um, and come to faith are through adversity. Now, there's a couple of reasons you have to bear with me um, why mine's a little bit different because I lived I lived my boyhood dream. I fulfilled my boyhood dream. And when I sit here talking to you now as a 39-year-old retired professional looking back on my career, I have to pin pinch myself. You know, the uh, journeys that I went on, went on, the things that I achieved, the people, more importantly, that I meant and the lessons that I learned, some of them archetypal lessons that are very directly related to the Bible, and, I, and I, I will come to them. But even though I live that dream and I've got these accolades and I'm not in any way trying to boast, in fact, I'm trying to impress upon you that even that isn't enough to fill that God-shaped hole at the centre of our hearts and minds. Um and when we look at the things that we try to achieve in life, when we set out um, quite idolatrously at, at a young age, which I'll explain a little bit later on, you know, we can chase things in life. And even when you achieve them, you know, to quote Ecclesiastes, it's absolutely meaningless. It's meaningless without God at the center of it. And that's what I want to try and really impress upon you uh, today. I'm going to start by um, screen sharing. I just want to show you this in pictures because it might give it a little bit of context for those who have not watched Rugby League before. So uh, for those who can see, this is a short video of uh, me playing rugby throughout my career. I think I'm 13 or 9, 1,309th player to have represented this great club. And I don't think there'll be many players within that time that's played with as many players as I have over the last 20 years as well. It's been wonderful and you know, with all the successes and some of the adversity as well, I think it's the people that you play with that you really treasure. That's where the real gratification and being able to do it in front of my hometown fans in my own city of Leeds has been a dream come true and uh, been a real privilege. And uh, you know, 20 years in, nearly done, nearly finished, coming to the end of my career, it's been, been a wonderful experience. Jamie Jones once more, through by three, brilliant shot. Short ball to Jamie Jones. Jamie Jones Buchanan for Leeds. It's one of the most uh, popular beards in rugby league. as a player the golden era the golden generation and I've seen all sides of it you know the ups and the downs and you've got to be there for all of it as a lead supporter it'll, uh, I'll never leave them all forsaken and uh, when I do finish I'll go back out and, uh, and stand in that south stand so 
So that was a little bit of an insight into my uh, journey. You can all still hear me. Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Um, it's funny, my, my name there, Jamie Jones Buchanan, you might all see JJB. That was the name that the fans give me. So in the world of Rugby League, I'm, uh, I'm known as JJB. And the reason being is because I've got the longest name in Rugby League. My full name's actually Jamie Daniel Peter Jones Buchanan. My mum wanted me to be called Daniel, it's a nice biblical name. And my dad wanted me to be called Peter, which is another great name as well. And so the bandit in the middle, as middle names, Jamie Daniel Peter Jones Buchanan. And why that's a bit crazy, a bit of a funny story is when I made my debut for Leeds, the kit man, the guy who makes the kit and puts the names on the back of the shirts, said that he couldn't fit Jones Buchanan on the back of the shirt. So in his infinite wisdom, what he did was he put Jones on the home shirt and Buchanan on the away shirt. So casual Leeds fans who were going to games are like going to away games going, who's this Buchanan here? He's worse than that Jones who played last week. We signed some rubbish this year. But anyway, a bit of a, a daft story. Seven years it took me to get my full name on the uh, back of my shirt. Uh, and when I did, I got my song. But again, that's another story as well. So this is just a bit of an insight in um, uh, some of the trophies that, that we won, went on to win. Uh, and we became known as the golden generation. It might have said in there, uh, the golden decade, because the most successful team in the club's 122-year history. But as I've sat down and, and obviously finished and retired, I've reflected on that career. And usually, Alan will have heard me speak before about the adversity that I, I went through during that time. So things like not getting picked for the team, um, horrific injuries, the worst of which kept me out for two years, and, and a whole multitude of other adversity that can surround our, our lives in sport. And I, uh, I always reached into the Bible as we do in Scripture uh, for strength. Christ is, is the centre of my foundation of my strength. But some of those stories from... Job to Jonah, right through Christ in Garden of uh, Gethsemane. You know, these, these pictures, these pillars of fortitude and perseverance is where the, the vast majority of the nucleus of my talk came from when I was talking about my career. But now that I've retired, I look back on some of these journeys and I can hardly remember some of the moments, you know, some of those video shots there, had it not been for the videos, I couldn't remember a lot of it. I couldn't tell you what, what the games were. Anything other than those pictures is, 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 is void. It's like a, a void memory, um, which is really interesting. What has become apparent is that the game itself was incidental. Now, what was really important was the real relationships that were forged um, and the journeys that we went on. Certainly this sort of team camaraderie, this, this team spirit, this, this love that we had for each other, this, this group of players who were very sacrificial uh, and very serving. And there's three really poignant stories I want to share with you, my group, my generation of players, and the reason why I think they were so successful. So this is me and Kevin Sinfield, who was our captain uh, there on the right-hand side. And uh, Kev's an unbelievable leader, crazy OCD, very benevolent and altruistic in his nature. Uh, and the reason why I'm at Wembley lifting the Challenge Cup here in front of 80,000 people with a suit on is because in the semi-final, I tore my quadricep tendon off my knee. Um, and the surgeon said to me, I, I, uh, I only operate on one of these at, at once a year, and that's usually with 65-year-olds. He said, I don't have a clue how you've done it, and I don't know if you'll ever fully recover. And I didn't, but I did play on for another four years um, by God's grace. But the reason why this is really important is because when I tore my quad, it, it meant that the rest of the season was over for me. I wouldn't go on to play at Wembley, uh, which the Leeds team went on and won in record style. Uh, and even worse than that, Kevin, who would be my best mate, who I'm lifting the trophy with there, uh, was retiring that year. So I would never play rugby league with him again, unfortunately. But he rang me and said, Jonesy, if we win the trophy at Wembley, I want you to come up and... Uh, and lift the trophy with me. And I had visions of um, these players uh, that run up with suits or get changed playing for Chelsea, like uh, uh, Lampard and some of the other guys there, um, and going up at Wembley. I said, hey, Daph, there's, there's no chance I'm going up in the suit. But because of Kev's nature and Danny Maguire and this other cohort, this new place of players that I spent the best part of 15 years with, it says, no, you're still a part of this group. You know, you're not um, gone or forsaken just because you can't play in this game. There's always a part of each other um, within the other player. So I went up and that was really symbolic. Small gesture, small gesture in the context of what happened, but really symbolic as to why it was really important and why that group of players were so selfless and sacrificial and willing to work hard for each other. Because the moments like this, we never forgot one another. Um, in 2019, another... Great friend of ours, teammate, one of the, the biggest parts, the biggest cohorts in that in that generation. 
and also one of the smallest players you'll ever come across. You know, we've got this stereotype of being seven foot tall and weighing 120 kilograms. Well, that gentleman to my left, as you look at it on the screen, Rob Burrow, uh, was one of the best players I've ever seen. Absolute world class, a hero. Uh, he's only this big, bless him. I don't think he grew after the age of 11. But he went on and became one of the toughest players known in uh, in the game and a world-class player at that. You know, Speedy Gonzalez darting in and around players um, completely shifted the paradigm of what the expectation of rugby league players were all about. Now, Rob, unfortunately, got diagnosed with motor neuron disease in 2019. And as you can imagine, it was really upsetting for us as teammates. And we've since done everything we can to rally around him uh, and make sure that him and his family uh, cared for and looked after uh, and again, that was really galvanised um, in our team spirit. Now, the photograph you're looking at was on the, the 12th of January 2020, uh, a little bit over 12 months ago. Uh, and the reason why it was so special is because all the players, having heard the, the, the devastating news of Rob being diagnosed, uh, came back to play. So that class that I came through, that generation, some of which were in the late 40s, all came back one more time to support Rob in a testimonial game and try to start the ball rolling in terms of raising money and awareness for motor neuron disease and obviously Rob. Now, in a really tough year where we're covered in COVID, raising money for charity is um, difficult. And as you can see, um, Rob had continued, you know, 12 months down the line nearly, um, struggling with this, with this disease. And Kevin uh, Sinfield, again, our captain and leader, took it upon himself to run seven marathons in seven days, which got taken and captured by the BBC in the hearts and minds of, of most of the UK. And he raised best part of two and a half million pounds in, in doing that and an immense amount of awareness, which hopefully will, will lead to some real cures. Now, what makes that significant is that Kev also said he was going to do them all in under four hours, and he did, which shows a level of commitment. These are rugby players, by the way. They're big, big, big human beings to run marathons, four of them on the bounce in seven days. Uh, and when you look at those five different versions of love within the Bible, like agape, the, the, the selfless, sacrificial, even if it's an archetypal version, you know, these, this group in a sporting context really had it. And that was the great, most gratifying part of my career. Very different sort of talk to what I used to give as a player, because this has really you know, come to the forefront of me since, since uh, I retired. Now, probably the most important player I've ever come across and who was very much a part of that group as well, um, but unfortunately, I live in New Zealand now, uh, so I couldn't be on that photograph and couldn't come back to play. Was a gentleman called Ali Lautiti. Now, Ali came to Leeds to play for Leeds in 2004. Uh, and when he walked through the changing room doors, he was one of the best players in the world. And me and him both play in the, uh, the same position. Uh, and I was still trying to cement a consistent play. You're frozen. But there's something really different about Ali. Um, and, you know, he was such a good player, gentle giant, ferocious on the pitch, carried the ball as if it was a peanut, this big rugby ball. But Ali was a Christian and made no secret the fact that he was a Christian. And you could tell in the way that he lived his life, the way that he behaved in the changing rooms around the players, his language, his vocabulary. Um, the way that he spoke and how weak and wild it was around players. As you can probably see, I'm beaming now, just, just looking at Ali. Uh, I love him a bit. And when I met Ali, it was an opportunity for me to ask a player and a colleague who I trusted over time, you know, got to know him really well, about his faith in Christ. Um, it made it no secret, the fact, the reason why he didn't want to go out drinking and partying like many of the other players, cantankerous players doing anything to get the next win, was because he had a faith. He, uh, he, he knew his creator and, and he professed Jesus to be his Lord and Saviour. Now, I'd grown up not in a, in a biblical home, but, you know, in the stereotypical sort of Anglican, British Northern background, going to church for weddings and christenings and formal events. And I'd heard of this person, Jesus, I had no idea who that was in the context of uh, theology within the Bible. I did believe in, in God. I, I did believe that there was an omnipotent, omnipresent power out there that governed all of us. I had no idea what that meant, but Ali invited me uh, along to church and I went with certain uh, expectations. As I said before, I expected 
this stereotype of uh, a building full of Ned Flanders from Symptoms wearing cardigans and, and sandals and all types of things. And what I found was a multitude of different people from all over the world, certainly in my church, evangelical, who, who all believed in, uh, in Jesus and uh, again. You're frozen again. Years, and years ago came in uh, manifestation, Emmanuel, God with us, and through his life, death, and resurrection. Forever winning at Wembley. Always associated with um, forging. Like biblical imagery, Proverbs 17, the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. The Lord tests the hearts and, and refines us through some of our experiences. We use gold and silver to signify success within sport, uh, but actually even that is entropic. It tarnishes, it, it fades away, it dies. We forget about some of those moments. I've never found anything that lasts forever until Ali pointed me to Christ. So I went to church. I did a Christianity Explored course um, with uh, our, our pastor. Those proverbial scales fell off my eyes and started to see where and, uh, and fame, building treasure in heaven. Oh, not so much that I was a better athlete and a performer on a weekend, but so I could glorify him in, in doing so. You're frozen again. You keep freezing, Jimmy. Am I? Am I freezing? Am I there? Hello. Hello. Have you got me? Yep, we got you. Big, big part of uh, my my journey is to, uh, by God's grace, be be like Isla and hopefully be a shining light in those changing rooms through the way that I speak, the way that I behave, and hopefully um, point people towards Christ as well as a professing uh, Christian. So I'll just uh, leave that screen share there. Stop the share. Uh, and we're back, we should be back on. Now, it's really important that I uh, just share with you who I am, so where I came from, why I ended up becoming a, a professional sportsman. Uh, and that's because as far back as I can remember from being three, four years old, going into school, I was a mixed race kid growing up in a Northern white working class society. And this society was unbelievably good. It was fantastic. I made some great friends. And I still live, live here now. I, I run around the streets every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at half past five. The streets that I grew up in and I run past the people that brought me up in those communities. But when I went to school, sport was a great way for me to identify myself. It became the centre of my identity. And the reason being is because even though I was born on 1st of August and I was youngest in my year, and 1st of August, by the way, if you don't know, is Yorkshire Day, so Yorkshire, most Yorkshire Yorkshire month ever. Uh, and I do feel like Jonah going to Nineveh when I have to go over to uh, Lancashire. But um, growing up in, in school, I quickly realised that sport was going to be the vehicle in which I lived my life. And that was because I was very coordinated, I was very strong. I was a good house brick taller than everybody else in my class, so I was, I was very big and, and suited for it. And that lent itself to me performing well in any game. And I quickly realised that when you win, you become popular and you make friends. And it was a double-edged sword because you could make friends and get back at your enemies by beating them on the sports field. And it did not matter what game it was. I was really competitive, what you'd know in sport as ego-motivated. And by that, it wasn't about winning the scoreboard or beating my previous best. It was about beating whatever challenge or competition was in front of me. And that actually had some benefits as well. So, you know, if it was a mass exam, a science exam, and there was a quantifiable way soon who finished top, I wanted to try and be the best. Now, where that was damaging is that it was a be-end-all and uh, the be-all and end-all of my life. And growing up as a teenager, you know, looking back, I certainly wasn't proud. This is long before I became a Christian. Uh, some of the th things in the lens that I'd go to to achieve those wins, you know, the way that you step over people uh, and my attitude towards it, you know, there's real pride in there. Uh, and again, to sign for Leeds as a 15 year old, really quickly made my debut in, uh, in 1999 as a 17 year old. And before we knew it, we'd won all these grand finals. We were playing at Wembley and Old Trafford and we were a really successful team within my own locality. 
But it wasn't until I, I met Ali and started going to church that I, I really understood and came to see that all those things outside of God and living uh, in a way that glorifies him is, is ultimately, ultimately meaningless. Um, again, those, 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 those virtues of perseverance and, and resilience uh, are all uh, biblically supported me and helped me uh, within my uh, journey as a professional sportsman. But the, the reason the reason behind why I got out of bed every day um, was to glorify God, to, to read my Bible, to be around other Christians uh, and, and to grow in, uh, in that regard. So it's been, um, it's been an amazing journey and one where, which by the time uh, I'd started going to church in 2006, I'd really started to grow and uh, I quickly realized that I needed to get married. I I'd met my wife when I was 14 She'd grown up in a Catholic background, um, an Irish family, lots, lots and lots of aunties and uncles. Um, so she had her own perceptions of what church was about. Um, we'd already had two children um, and Mike Wildsmith encouraged me to get married. Uh, I got married in 2008 uh, when I got back from World Cup. And then not long after that, I think uh, I got baptized as well. Uh, and my baptism was one of the most emotional moments of my day. I remember um, there was two services, one in the morning um, and then there was one in the evening. I was being baptised in the, the evening one and I went down, I was nearly in tears watching people give their lives to Christ uh, in the morning and I couldn't wait and having this opportunity to, to bring family and friends to church and show them how this person of Jesus Christ had turned, changed me, my life, my aspirations and who I wanted to be and ultimately this identity that was previously all about winning. Um, it was a great opportunity to, to profess that. And I remember running up the stairs, we've got like a bit of a, a podium in front of the uh, the pool in which we were baptised. And I, I wanted to get in, I just felt like diving off and no, behave yourself, Jonesy, you, you're a Christian now. And I went down, got in, in the pool uh, and uh, given my life to Jesus. And ever since then, you know, being a father of, of four boys, we've got four boys now, by God's grace, you know, uh, my, my marriage, and I got married, I had in Christ Jesus written in Aramaic on my wedding ring as a, as a prayer, really, that um, God would be at the centre of everything. You know, the Bible starts and ends with, with a, a marriage, and um, my marriage is without doubt the biggest blessing uh, of my life. You know, my wife is my best friend, and the fruits of that relationship, uh, what give me the most joy uh, this godly institution and in fact whilst people have been locked down over the last 12 months and you know we all know that social isolation kills people and we're not created to be alone um my relationship with my wife and my, me as a father as well has grown exponentially through that opportunity though i can't wait uh, to obviously get back out and then i went on and changed in the changing rooms so obviously becoming a christian um the way that i behaved in the changing rooms completely changed uh, and the lads who'd known me from when I was a kid had seen this change come about. And when they referred to the old cantankerous version of me, that was kick fighting and biting and going out and drinking and all the rest of it, uh, and just being a nuisance, they referred to me as Jones in BC. Do you remember Jones in BC before Christ? And I'm like, no, I'd rather not actually. But what that was, was um, real sort of outward showing that my, my life had changed and I was a different person and, Jesus was at work in my life. Now, there are some um, disadvantages. You know, I think being a Christian and, and reading the Bible on a daily basis, we come to uh, see why we need Jesus, because we are sinners and we're so far away from God's perfection and um, you know, we, we crave for his, his justice. And you know, whilst we are professing believers, we still get things wrong, still make errors. And certainly when you play in rugby league, um, on a Friday night <laughs> in front of potentially millions of people or 80,000 at Wembley. And um, the referees made a couple of bad decisions. You're reading about the ultimate uh, just God who never gets a decision wrong and then a referee misses a call. And then some uh, oppos opposite number gives you a bit of a smacky mouth and you've lost a couple of teeth and you're bleeding everywhere and you might have a bit of a fractured cheekbone. And then you drop a ball and 30,000 people are telling you exactly what they're thinking and all these stresses are starting to build up around you. Um, you can be guilty of lashing out. You know, If the cameras was on us every day of the week when we stub our toes on the radiators and some of those moments when we flash up, um, you know, we'd, we'd find ourselves wanting, and certainly on the rugby pitch, 
uh, that can be the case. Um, but actually, it's also amazing in that there's a chance to witness, there's a chance to talk about my faith. You might have seen me pointing to air, giving glory to Godwin, scoring a couple of the tries, saying prayers on the pitch with a, an iron squad that was uh, led by Jesse Senna-Rafeo, one of Castleford players. So you can imagine our biggest, one of our biggest rivals, certainly in 2017, was the Castleford Tigers. Uh, and despite them beating us about eight times on trot up until we, we beat them in the final, in the grand final, then after the games, me and Jesse was a castle for playing. So You're frozen, James. You're frozen again. You're frozen. It'll come back itself, Alan. Uh, Lancashire, I don't know, Yorkshire and Lancashire. It's um, it's a war that's gone on since the, the Battle of the War of the Roses. So it's a medieval battle that's continued in, in rugby league. Uh, we're all good friends off the pitch, by the way. But we'd gone over, I'd gone over to Wigan uh, one evening and I was uh, I was giving my testimony. And we'd played Wigan a couple of weeks before. And I'd scored a try. And I don't score many tries, but I'd scored a try in this particular game. Uh, so I had the upper hand and we won. But this, uh, this part of this congregation, he said... What about that eye tackle you give away on that kid? You clean nearly took his head clean off his shoulders. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. Sometimes I do get it wrong, but I have been told it's more blessed to give than receive. So that, that's how I tried to, to sell it to those guys. But listen, we, we do get it wrong. But I, I do pray and, and, and think about something that our pastor once said to us in a sermon. And he said, you know, we're all like tubes of toothpaste. And when we're under pressure and we get squeezed, Whatever is in, inside will inevitably come out. And um, there are through prayer, through being around other Christians, through reading God's word and uh, welcoming that into my uh, heart and mind, I just pray that when I do get squeezed, that it is, it is godly uh, that comes out. But that in itself has uh, certainly some, uh, some challenges. So that's, that's um, pretty much me and my journey. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to ask me, I'm about, do you know what, I'm about 10 minutes shorter than I usually am, uh, to be honest with you, uh, but I don't just want to keep going on, Alan, I don't know if anybody... Uh, with I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some questions coming to you, Jeremy, but uh, great sharing what, you, what you've done tonight, and uh, very honest, very humorous, it's great to have a good laugh, but, uh, how, you know, you didn't mention about Wigan being a great team, though, I mean, Wigan are a great <laughs> team. <laughs> <laughs> they are good. We're rivals for a reason, Alan. We're rivals for a reason. I do love yeah, them. yeah. But you know, you said, you know, Jamie said tonight that uh, all these trophies and that, and it really they don't mean anything in eternity. They win all these trophies, all these medals down here, great, but you can't take it with you. And the the most greatest reward you can get is to have God's favor and to know Him. And Jamie would love you tonight to know him, to know the Lord Jesus Christ as he knows him. And you can do that tonight. Very simple. And the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And because we're sinners, we, we can't go to heaven without that sin being taken away. And that's why Jesus came and he died on the cross in your place and my place to pay the penalty for, for our sins. And all we have to do is repent. That means turn away from our sin, acknowledge we've done things wrong, ask God to forgive us, and ask Jesus to come into our heart and life. And if we do that, he gives us a free gift of eternal life. And you can receive that. It's a free gift. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. But it's a free gift. But you have to receive it. And I'd like to give you that opportunity, and all Jamie would too, to invite you to come and know the same Jesus that Jamie knows. If you would like to do that, I'm going to say a little prayer, and I'd like you to pray this prayer with me sincerely tonight and mean it with all your heart. Just pray this right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that I am a sinner because the Bible says we have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, and that includes me. But I believe Jesus that you died on the cross in my place, taking the punishment for my sins. And you poured out your precious blood to wash my sins away. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. 
I turn to you with all my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my life right now by your spirit and give to me the free gift of eternal life. I receive you now. Thank you for coming into my life. Now I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. That Jesus is the son of God. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And that God has raised him from the dead. And I thank you Lord. For saving me. For making me a child of God. Help me to live for you from this day forward, to serve you, to glorify your name in everything I do. And I look forward to that day when I will be with you forever in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please let us know by contacting us on the number you see on the screen. 07943 Thanks, Jamie. And I'm going to hand over to George now. I'm sure he's got plenty of questions for you. Okay, George. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jamie. No, Jamie, thank you so much for being so honest. And um, I watched with, um, the video. It was very good, actually. I saw lots of styles there. Okay, so the first question I have for you. What's happened to your hair? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great question. It all fell out. And uh, it fell out, well, it started to fall out. I was about 22. And um, I, I hung on for as long as I could, trust me. But um, <laughs> it's funny, 2007, one of the, we went back in uh, for pre-season training and one of the players said, right, let's grow beards and moustaches until we've won three games on the bounce. Um, now, we didn't start very well this particular season. <laughs> And some of these boys fancy themselves as being quite good looking. Now, I, I, I can't claim that. So um, that some of them started to cheat. And I thought, you know what? We've committed to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it. I've never tried growing a beard in my life. And this beard was massive by the end of 2007. And I thought, you know what? This is a great replacement for my hair. So uh, since <laughs> then or thereabouts, I've, I've been known as the guy with uh, the beard. And it's become quite iconic. So that's my hair's fallen out, mate. It's gone long gone, unfortunately. Same as me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a conscious uh, decision you made to create your image as such, like with the beard and that? No, no. Um, you can imagine, you know, when, when I talk, people uh, say James Jones Buchanan is religious. You know, Christianity is probably not the first religion that comes to mind, obviously, with uh, a long beard. Certainly when it come, uh, when I first grew it, it was massive. But no, nah, there's no, there's no real, I'm not precious about it. I could trade it off tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not bothered at all. Um, but it, it was just something that became s synonymous for me. And I thought, I'll just, just keep hold of it. But, you know, one day it might just, just disappear if I fancy it. Thank you, Jamie. Well, you started very, very young, of course, uh, uh, playing. Um, did it run in the family or was it something you decided you wanted to do? No, I was the first person to play rugby. I was the first. Uh, my mum my mom played a bit of sport and I think my dad did, but nobody played uh, any sort of professional uh, role like that. And I was the first person to play rugby league and I just used to watch it on television. I, I moved in uh, next door to some boys when I was uh, seven years old. So my, my stepdad was in the uh, Navy and um, he was in the... the uh, uh, the submarines, the nuclear subs up in Fazlane. But when we come back down, um, when I was about seven, we moved in next door to two rugby players and uh, they were the biggest kids in the street. So they decided what game we played. Um, and they had a big patch of grass outside our house and they always wanted to play rugby. So we uh, we give each other names and that line up against wall. And, uh, and they taught me how to play rugby. It was an involuntary education. And I loved it. And the reason why I did like rugby is because I, I spoke about being really big and physical. If you're losing on the scoreboard in rugby, and set this the right way, by the way, even if you're losing on the scoreboard, you can still physically dominate your uh, your, your opponent and feel like you've got to win, you know, from a, an alpha male type point of view, in a game sort of sense. And so I, I love the rough and tumble uh, and the fortitude that comes with, with playing a game like rugby league. So that's what stuck with me. And uh, obviously signed for Leeds when I was, when I was 15 and the, the rest is history. Exactly. You became a megastar. So... Not many of us have been, are famous. 
Can you tell us what it's really like to be famous? Do you have paparazzi and do you have to watch what you do <laughs> and things like that? No, so I mentioned right at the beginning, rugby league is a Northern England uh, game. So as soon, as soon as you get 25 miles south or 25 miles north, nobody's got a clue who I am or who rugby league, what rugby league is. It's a very, it's a very short parochial game that, that transcends a, cor- a corridor called the M62, a motorway in North of England. Beyond that, nobody, who's, who's, who's Jimmy Jones Buchanan? But, you know, I mentioned again, I think there was a study done in rugby league uh, about two years ago, RFL commissioned a study called the Dividend Report. And this dividend report, it, it, it looked into the social and economic effect of sports like rugby league and boxing. And they're the top two games for reaching into the, some of the most socially deprived areas um, in the country and certainly within north of England. Um, and I think that just underlines and signifies that the game of rugby league, anybody that's been in it or understands it, is a very working class, down to earth sport. And they're, they're very much like cowboys and Indians. They're all they're like the cowboys in the saloon and they, they're all fighting each other and carrying on. And they're always arguing, you know, this little tribal parochialness. But actually, when there's a bit of adversity that comes over the hill, when there's an enemy coming, they all team up together and they get together as a game and, and they seem to survive. So we were, we were born out of rebellion because back in 1895, the Northerners couldn't afford to play rugby union uh, on a weekend and, and not get paid. So they started playing them and thereby is the game of rugby league born. Uh, Gridiron, American football, I believe, was born uh, not too uh, long after through rugby union as well. But um, nah, nobody knows me uh, as, as, when I get outside of Bramley. And everybody that does know me knew me when I was four or five years old anyway. So that's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you were famous in the rugby league uh, world. Um, tell us about some of the temptations that were there. I mean, was there parties, drink, drugs and things like that? Yeah, so no, never drugs. I was never into drugs. My mum, my was like, I, was, I had a real loving family and uh, you know, things like that. I never... Listen, I'm not perfect by it in any means. Um, never did not illegal. Certainly drinking, yeah, absolutely. So there's um, this again, this northern working class culture. There's a, a, a lot of drinking goes on. So when, later on, as I started to get older, I could go out in the town. They'd go out and um, drink uh, beer. He'd be chasing women and, and all the rest of the things that teenage lads get distracted with. Um, I, I guess. I suffer like any other human with, with those temptations. Uh, and the, the, the overarching idol was the win. So I wanted to be a professional player. And that, that in itself encompasses a lot of sacrifice, a lot of self-discipline, a lot of hard work, a lot of training. There are, it's funny, a lot of people now in charities, they ask me to come and speak about um, physical well-being and mental health. So much going wrong around mental health now and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it, it, it's something I've always taken for granted, mental health, by God's grace. Again, I've always been pretty good. I've always had a good support network. But it just blows me away that people fail to make the link between physical and mental health. And you know, we, we're really quick to talk about that. But actually, when you ask people, what's your physical health like? Um, and they haven't got much of an answer. And that's because it, it, it means, as human beings, we've got to make this difficult decisions about what we eat, what we drink, and uh, how, how we exercise. And unfortunately... We just can't do it. We all have weaknesses. I cannot lock a door to save my life. I struggle to uh, fill my COVID app in um, on, on the morning, you know, this little app. And it's not because I don't want to. I'm just not very good at ticking boxes. I'd be the worst accountant in, a, in, in the world. But when it comes to being disciplined and uh, being wanting to get on a, on a course or go on a journey, that's always been pretty good. So um, the reason why I bring that up is because to, to get that win and be a professional, always overruled the drink and the distractions and everything else that might come about. So in a way, sport was something that kept me on the secular straight and narrow. But again, as I mentioned and tried to articulate there, even then the gold, the silverware and everything that I did achieve through those sacrifices were ultimately meaningless because you know, for the most part of it, God wasn't at the centre of it um, until I met Ali, as I mentioned. So you mentioned the win was the ultimate thing there for you. What was it like then when you finally fell over the line with the ball and the crowd rose? What was that like? So I told you about my name. And yeah. uh, whenever, you, whenever you play sport in England, you'll know if you watch football or rugby or any sport, really, the fans sing songs about the players or they sing songs about the team. And everybody in the team seemed to have a song apart from me. 
And I could never understand it. And uh, I'd score at Anderson. I'd got a lot to get me wrong. No say about profit in his own town. I'm just local kid down street who's uh, grown up in Bramley, played for Leeds. And I, listen, I won't great. My my biggest gift as a player was being distinctly average for long periods of time. I was just a grafter. But now and again, I did get over at try line and I score a try and I walked back on side and it was complete silence. It's like tumbleweed blowing through the stadium. Thinking, what's going on here? Surely somebody must think of a song. And I always blamed on the fact that nobody knew my name. My name was that long. And in 2007, I remember scoring the try. I did get over the line and walking back on side and the old crowd erupted. Went, Jamie Jones, Jamie Jones, Jamie, Jamie Jones. He's got no song. His name's too long. Jamie, Jamie Jones. <laughs> so it, it transpired. I didn't have a song because my name was too long. But when I did get a song and it was about not having a song, it was wonderful. So, yeah, there's the stand up back here, Nick. But again, I look into that crowd and I can see where my mum stood. I can see where all my old teammates are stood. And whilst there might be 15,000 people in there, I reckon I know a vast majority of them. So uh, it's always been pretty nice. Well, you said you didn't score many tries, but it says here you scored 77. Yeah, over 20 <laughs> years. So yeah. we average it out. It's a bit there. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, so, so of the trophies that you won, is there one particular trophy that you cherish more than the rest? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I mentioned Leeds. I'm I'm biggest Leeds fan. Like I, I love Leeds as a city where I've grown. It's my hometown. Um, and Leeds United is obviously our football team back in the Premiership. And um, I, I grew up as a Leeds United fan and I used to have these reoccurring dreams. It was all about sport when I was a child. And I, I, I dreamt that I'd be the first ever Leeds United and Leeds Rhinos player. Um, that was never going to happen, by the way. But uh, I went to play for Leeds Rhinos. But when we played in the World Club Challenge Games, so that's when the winner of the English competition plays the winner of the Australian competition. We play at a neutral venue and quite often we played them at Ellen Road. So uh, we first played Canterbury Bulldogs um, at Ellen Road in 2005 and we become world champions. So representing Leeds uh, for the Rhinos, rugby league, my favourite sport, at Ellen Road, which was one of the, the iconic grounds of Leeds, was like, it was brilliant and uh, become a world champion there. and went on to beat Melbourne Storm and, and a couple more and become World Cup champions three times. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, playing at uh, Ellen Road. Excellent. Now, in your Jamie BC days, okay, yeah. was there ever a time in a game where you said to like there's somebody on the pitch, I'm going to get him? Yeah, every week. <laughs> 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 yeah, every week. Um, and I don't know what that is. I don't know what that, that, that alpha male. There was, there was some. I, it, it's like that. It's this hierarchy, and um, I, I guess it's related to competition. When, when you're competitive and you, you, you look at a board, you want to see yourself in, in number one. And, yeah. and part of that was obviously being physically um, strong as well, the, the physical side of it, when it be boxing, MMA and these other combat sports. Rugby League is a very combative game and that, that was a very attractive part of it. Um, and listen, you'd still play tough within the rules, even when I was a Christian, that was absolutely uh, a part of it. We all cross those lines with a, an absolute expectation of what, what's expected to, of us as, as professional players. And you know, it's very hard to, to run as fast as you can into somebody without causing some kind of sure. calamity. So, um, yeah, that, that's, um, the, the, that, that was always a, a part of the game. But the intent, the intent was, uh, was, was very different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, and again, I think the thing that I always struggled with even as a Christian, the toughest part of playing as a professional player, it might be much to my shame, was the referees. I really, really struggled with when uh, we didn't get the right decision. I'd be constantly on at it. Is, is this referee having a laugh? Did he not see this? Um, and, I, and again, it, it always comes out of justice. Is this, this part of us at the core of us wants absolute, absolute justice. Um, and when you don't get it on the field, sometimes it can see, feel very unjust. But human beings uh, are obviously human as well. Now, you also mentioned in your testimony about it, there was a great uh, group of guys and you know, build relationships. How important at the time was that group to you, that the relationship that you had? Yeah, the players, the players that I played with, they were, they were huge. We, we were like brothers because we um, met predominantly when we were sort of 12, 13. And you see this, don't you, in sports teams like oh, look at Class of 92 at Man United mm -hmm. uh, and so many others. I don't think it's any um, coincidence that teams like Wigan and St. Helens, Leeds, um, to a degree, uh, uh, maybe maybe a bit of uh, uh, Bradford back in the day, uh, were successful. They brought a lot of young players through the system. 
uh, through their academies and the, 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 the promoted from within. And when you, when you forge those relationships, what it does is it, it enables you to go an extra, an extra mile for your teammate. And this is, this is a really big sort of question that's sort of highlighted to me since retiring, this sort of task versus ego motivation. Now, when, you, when, you're, when you're on a field and you think you've gone, you, you've got to go make a tackle. And if you don't make a tackle, this guy might score and you might lose the final at Old Trafford. And you, but you've got no energy left and there's blood pouring out of every orifice and you, you're, you're aching, you've done 80 minutes uh, and you just don't know how you're going to get there. And this is this is a fact, this. It's, it's been proven in sport. If I, wanted to, if I was to get there for myself, the likelihood of me getting there is very low. But it's been shown, particularly in sport, there's a lot of evidence that if I want to get there for my teammate, then I will get there. For some reason, we, we, we seem predisposed to doing work for other people as human beings. Uh, and because I had that such that uh, relationship with those players, I would get there and make that tackle for that player inside of me. And, and this is what I was trying to say earlier. You still see that now, even though we're not playing anymore. Those players still have those relationships where they're doing things and going to places that they would never ordinarily do, uh, but do so because they've got this bond with, um, with, with an individual that they've, they've been through uh, an immense journey with. So, Jamie, AD, then, have you forged some new relationships with other people who are Christians and the people around you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, obviously, starting with my own church, um, I've grown there in uh, in my faith and the, the church fellowship that we we have. There's lots of people that I've been around with, uh, some evangelists. One of my my favourite guys who I love spending time with is a guy called Roger Carswell, who um, who goes around a lot of churches up and down um, England, telling stories a, a little bit like yourselves and uh, being with him. And, and lots of friends in sport. I don't know, it's, it's interesting. Um, there was a, a group called Christians in Sport and through which I, I had the opportunity to meet other sports and professing Christians. In rugby league, you find that a lot of them are islanders. So they come over from New Zealand, Papua New Guinea or, um, or Fiji and, and Tonga and, and Samoa. And it's much more part of the culture. Certainly in the north, the, it, it's <laughs> England with the, you know, the fairly stiff neck um, northerners. It, it can be difficult sometimes. Um, though they ask questions at some really key moments. But uh, it was a real blessing uh, that Rob Louie, who's um, one of our players at Leeds Rhinos, got baptised last week, which was, uh, okay. was wonderful to hear. hear. And uh, just ace, unbelievable to see him uh, reading the Bible, coming to understand who, who Jesus is. And again, it, it's, it's a life. We don't know who, whose life we affect and when. Um, you know, God waters those seeds, and, and, and you know, even though I've grown up going in churches, it wasn't until this guy who come from New Zealand uh, came over and sort of impressed upon me the living Christ that I started asking those questions. Um, and, and Ali, again, was, was an unbelievable guy. R rather than going and living in all Woodley in some of the posh areas of Leeds, he came to live in Bramley. Uh, with me. And I remember the um, first thing I did was well, I tried to look after him. He needed to cut his edges. He bought an house that was all overgrown. And I lent him some ladders. And uh, Ali went and left um, it, the ladders outside his house, which is a schoolboy area in Bromley. Right. <laughs> Bromley, what burglary capital at UK 2013. That's right. <laughs> so somebody's seen his ladders and they've climbed up his, these ladders into his window, nicked his car keys, drove his car straight through uh, part of his garden wall and disappeared. So that's lesson number one. And then another time he was in his room and uh, he could see his hedges completely ablaze on fire. And he must, must have at the time been like the burning bush. Well, he looked out, but this, this bush had been heavily consumed uh, and he's run out and some kids had, had set his uh, bush on fire. And then, uh, and then another time, last one, um, I, I got a joiner to go around and help him fix his kitchen, put a new kitchen in. <laughs> and within about six weeks, he ran me up and said, Jonesy, I filled this, these cupboards full of plates and all, all, all wood's fallen off at wall, all kitchen units have come off at wall. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, only in Bramley. But this never, ever swayed Ali, you know, just persevered. And you know, when we read, like, book, uh, Alan might have heard me talk about it before, book of Job, like, I, it, just blows me away, you know, this, the earliest books in the Bible, chronologically. 
Uh, and this this guy, Job, that has, you know, we, we learn early on that this guy is the most righteous in all the land and he's got everything that he, he could ever want. Uh, and, and God allows Satan to take these these things away. But he, it, whilst he doesn't always understand it and he's got these really unhelpful friends coming along, um, talking to him on a daily basis, he sort of perseveres with his face towards God and, and and sticks with it on a on a on a scale of one to ten is suffering at, at three hundred. You know, it's horrendous, and hopefully we'll never have to suffer like that. But just seeing the way that some people persevere in Christ is just is uh, is mind blowing. And again, it, it's been extremely blessing and useful seeing that and knowing that um, Jesus Himself, Garden of Gethsemane, not my will but yours be done. Um, you know, just uh, amazing bits of the Bible of of real sort of toughness and, and fortitude. Amen. Now, you started again at a very young age and you, you actually said you achieved your dream at a very young age. Yeah. When you achieved your dream, how did you feel? Did you feel, wow, I've made it or was it an anti-climax or did you think if that was it or what was, how was it? How was it? You know, at night, I think it was Barcelona Olympics, Linford Christie uh, won 100 metre final at age of 32 and broke world record. And I think in his book, he said, as soon as he crossed the line, he just went... Is that it? All that effort, and that's it. It's done. Um, and it's an interesting question. I never, ever, ever, at any point in my my life as a player thought I'd cross the finish line. Never, ever. And even right up to my last game, you're always asking yourself, "What can I do better? How can I be uh, a better servant player to my to my teammates?" Um, and what was the most difficult part of it was damage limitation. Because once we get past 32, 33. Physically, no matter how professional or determined you are or resilient, we, we get old, we age, and we just can't be the physical version of ourselves that we previously um, were. And that, you know, um, we've got to manage that and we've got to start using this and pass on to that next generation of players some of the lessons and habits that, that we learned. But there was, to answer your question, there's a degree of humility within this working class sport, but I never for one minute thought I'd ever finished it's only on reflection now that i've sat for the best part of nearly 18 months thinking about my career thought yeah there's there some really nice moments and seeing more importantly that relationship that was forged continue beyond the game just yeah. make the game that bit more incidental now you're very enthusiastic and your enthusiasm is the infectious was there ever a time when you were down or you mentioned about being injured for two years how did how did that affect you mentally it, it was horrendous. So my first injury, I tore my groin off, my, my uh, adductors off my groin, and I had best part of two years with um, uh, pubic symphysis. So they, I had two operations where they had to release my gr gracilis adductor, and it was the most horrendous pain. And I, and I don't know how it happened, whether there was an incident, but what had happened was my sacroiliac joint, my SI joint, had come away, so the, the sort of hip bone had moved away from my pelvis slightly. Uh, and they said that that only happens when... Um, motorcyclists crashed the motorbike and they split the pelvis on the, the, the petrol tank. It was it was a right mess. And it took me the best part of two years. I couldn't sleep on my side. I had to sleep on my back or my front. It was that painful. Uh, and that was when I was 18. So I've not even really made any inroads into being a professional player. And I thought, this is it. This is it. But um, we had a coach at the time called Dean Bell who was all about mental toughness and perseverance. And uh, you know, the, the club itself gave me every opportunity to, to recover. And I did. I was a different player to reinvent myself when I did. Uh, but I, having, having sort of got through that, I've torn pretty much every muscle in the lower extremity, my quads, my calves, my hamstrings several times, tore my bicep off off. Um, my, elbow, my 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 forearm again St. Ellen's one game and played half a game with it. Um, but you grew up with a sort of this this Spartan toughness where you know injuries, if you could run, you could play. You know, it was very different now, certainly with concussion rules. But we were trained to to carry on unless you physically couldn't work anymore. Um so the the, the injuries were were tough, but the, you were conditioned to it as well, conditioned for it both mentally and physically. So you're not finished just yet, Jimmy, yeah? No, so at the minute I'm an assistant coach. Um, I own a media pro production company as well. Um, I mentioned at the start, I like to tell stories and I, I love some of my favourite methods are uh, through film and video. Um, I think stories are really important to share people's uh, lives. 
Um, and, and I'm involved in a fair few charities as well. Leeds is a city that I've grown up in. Sport is a great vehicle uh, on which to share some really important messages, not, not least my faith as a Christian, but also support some of the more vulnerable people within society. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of a domestic violence uh, charity, um, uh, another charity that feeds kids who've, who've struggled this year, especially not being at school, not getting the, the school meals that they, they would usually get and, uh, and all host of other things locally just to try and give back to some of that uh, community as well. But, um, but, but, but yeah, I'm not finished. We're never finished. I mean, we're always persevering in, in life. I've got, I've got one final question for you before I bring you a couple of messages that people have sent in. Yeah. Um, I asked this of all the guests. Of all the decisions that you've made in your life, what was the best decision you ever made? Oh, yeah, becoming a Christian, going to church and, uh, and, and finding out who Christ was, you know, starting that Christianity explored and going through the comprehension of um, Mark's gospel, I think it was, um, with uh, Rico Tyson who narrated it and, uh, and coming to know who, who Jesus was. And, and again, the, the effect on your life from then, all those God-created things, those good things, those blessings that we have, um, in this general revelation, this creation that we, we breathe and exist in on a daily basis, are exponentially um, increased by knowing who God is and, and having him at the centre of your life. They're right, having him right at the top of the tree, not money, not wealth, not power, not um, not food or any, any other thing that you might stick at the top of your uh, hierarchy and importance tree. When God's at the top of it, everything else is is how it should be. And you know, certainly I mentioned my wife, and my marriage being uh, the, the most fruitful of those godly institutional blessings uh, oh, for being yeah. a Christian. So, yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Now, there's a couple of messages. First one came through, says, uh, George, uh, Jamie came to Lou in Cornwall and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Do you remember me? Do you remember me? I remember that. I remember that. So I don't like flying me and I, I'd go on a British holiday every single day uh, of uh, the year, every year. And I've never been to Cornwall, so I went down and uh, yeah, yeah, Paul, Paul, um, he gave me his uh, caravan for a, uh, his, his, his for a, for a week, and it was unbelievable. And then we went to Dorset, and uh, I, went, I did visit a couple of churches down there, and it, it was brilliant, real blessing. So anybody who's there, great to hear from you. We've also got a message from Bill Asher, his former rugby league uh, legend, is watching on Facebook. Bless him. He said he's been so blessed uh, by watching you, and he can't wait to see you again. Great to see you, mate. I was only talking to you the uh, other day to uh, Brad Dwyer and um, our Wigan contingent over there um, in, uh, in uh, the Leeds Rhinos when I came over at uh, Aspel, Aspel Methodist, and it was great to see you, mate, and uh, again, talk about our face. So, hope you're well, pal. Staying safe. He says here that uh, against New Zealand 71, no other forward ever chipped a ball over the top and scored the New Zealanders. <laughs> They never seen that before, and was a pro the first man for, for, from man from GB. Was that you chipping the ball? No, that definitely wasn't me. Certainly, uh, it wasn't me. It was, it was a man of many talents. Uh, redefined the forwards role. Brilliant, love it. Well, it's been fantastic speaking to you, Jamie. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm. Thank you for your honesty, and we wish you all the best in the future, of course. And uh, with that, I'll just hand back over to Alan. Jamie, it's been a real inspiration listening to you again tonight. I've heard you many times and I always get blessed by your sharing. Really thrilling to hear you. Yeah, Bill Asher said he'd love to come and share one night, perhaps like this. Perhaps we'll have him on one night and tell his story, the legend from Wigan. Yeah. Um, but uh, Ian and Christina have said that they've been playing, praying regularly for Rob Burroughs. He said they pray regularly for him. Have you had a chance to share with him or pray with him? And uh, how is he? Yeah, so in his early onset, he, uh, I actually took him to a church and did pray for him, and um, he, he did he did explore it. And then the first lockdown came when the the virus came about, and we just couldn't get anywhere near him. Obviously, because he's vulnerable, um, you couldn't get anywhere near Rob. And I've I have seen him maybe once since in in since the first lockdown. I spoke to him many times, been on Zoom calls with him. But because of the vulnerable nature in which is and the, the deterioration of MND, um, it's been difficult to uh, to get near him. But yes, absolutely. To answer your question, I was being and I really thank you for your prayers as well. And I was I'd ask you to keep continue to do that because uh, he's uh, he's a love, he's a lovely kid and he has he has explored it. He has asked them questions. Great. Um, sorry, so uh, thanks. Uh, Go on, George. Yeah. Another message from Bill Ashurst. He says. Uh, 
He never scored that often, he says. <laughs> and very rarely against Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's a real battle tonight between Yorkshire and Lancashire, <laughs> between Wigan and, and Leeds. And we've also got St. Helens supporters watching as well tonight. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thanks, Jamie. It's been absolutely tremendous hearing you. And, uh, and uh, if you've watched this tonight and you want to make a decision in your life, you know, God has given every one of us the chance to, to have eternal life. Well, we'll have eternal life somewhere. We're going to live forever. God's given, he's going to live everybody uh, life forever, but in one or two places, either heaven or hell. You make the decision. And I, I ask that you might make that decision that you want to be in heaven with Jamie and with, with others. And you can do that by con contacting us on this number that you see on your screen or by going to our uh, website, bmflifestories.com. And you're there you can find out about the Salvation Prayer Link. And so to, uh, I'll just remind you that we will be back again next Monday at 8 o'clock UK time with uh, Daniel Dugmore, who traveled the world as an extreme sports enthusiast until his life crashed after being hooked on Class A drugs. Then God's got a hold of his life and has done amazing work with him. He's now working with youth with a mission, going to many of the poor places in Africa, helping people. So we, he'd probably be on from Africa. I think he's in Malawi or somewhere like that. So that's next Monday. Also, you can go on to Life Stories at Lunch on YouTube. And if you go on there and uh, click on and, and subscribe to Life Stories at Lunch, you can go and watch all the stories from all our Monday nights. There have been uh, wonderful stories every Monday. You can watch all those or on, you can see them on Facebook. But please uh, contact us on this number. If you have any needs, you need help in any way, please contact us on this number. So we look forward to seeing you again next Monday. And again, Jamie, thanks so much. We pray God will bless you and continue to use you and that you will inspire many, many people and many will follow Christ because of your testimony. God bless you. Love you and love your family. God bless you all. Thanks for all being with us.